seen, my daughter's here, and, and she's 11. She'll be 11 next week, so if you hear some air piping up from the back, then and, uh, she's just full of questions right now about her world. Everything, everything regarding, you know, from cheese to, to Kleenex is pretty fascinating for her. So I thought, why not? Start her out right and bring her to a lecture in particle physics. Huh? But if you hear her chiming up, then uh, she probably has those questions and probably wants you to help her formulate them. She'd appreciate it a lot. If she's got questions, then yours are probably better. Um, I'll give you a little back, my background. I'm now at the Space Radiation Analysis Group, like you said, and we're working with, with all aspects of uh, the symmetry for the crewed missions. We don't deal with anything about satellite charging and, and drag and things like that. We're specifically for the human system in, in the space program. We are the operational folks. We sit console when anybody's flying and we provide real-time uh, recommendations to the flight directors and, and the flight surgeons in case of contingencies when they're on EVA and just kind of the normal background exposures for the duration of a mission and, and monitor and, and keep track of that um, on a daily and, and hourly basis. And we watch other NASA satellites and, and kind of monitor the, the general space environment and looking for solar flares and, and things like that in case they have to replan the EVA. Um, Prior to that, I spent some time at Stanford University. I worked at the Stanford Linear Accelerator in the Radiation Physics Department, designing shielding for the new beam lines, the free electron laser they're designing. So we had we had a 400 meter beam line, and pretty much had to shield most of that. Um, I spent some time at, at a number of years at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Prior to that, working on these same issues for NASA from the other side, from the soft money side. The, the material scientists at Marshall would develop new materials and wanted them tested. And since we were doing uh, charge particle physics, looking at, at charge changing, measuring the charge changing cross section to better build the Monte Carlo transport codes, um, we would bootstrap our experiments, bootstrap their samples into our experiments, and, and test materials for their dose reduction and make some recommendations. Um, before that, I was a graduate student in radiation physics, and we we were building and testing um, detectors that were designed to measure the energy deposition patterns on scales of volumes of tissue. So we're we're, we're simulating two micron spheres and measuring the microscopic energy deposition patterns, which immediately relates to biology and DNA damage and things like that. Um, so I've pretty much been wrapped up in some aspect of the space program except for Stanford since inception. And it's good work. It's a lot of fun when you can get it. And this kind of is the broad picture of a lot of that. Um, so I'll just get going. I'll start out with kind of the, the basics of why we have a problem. Not really a problem, but, but state the nature of the problem and look at what we're going to do about it later. But to give you kind of an idea of, of a space mission, the average background radiation in the U.S. is about two to three millisieverts. And I don't know everybody's background in the room. I'm not going to get caught up in, in defining all the terms. This is given as a point of reference. Millisieverts a dose. It's the energy imparted to a matter divided by the mass of the matter that the energy is imparted to. So it's just a definition. But the average U.S. background from, from terrestrial radiation, from cosmic rays that actually have spallation products in the atmosphere make it to the earth from radon in the environment is it's about two to three that's a little higher in boulder where the radon's high and the, the granite's exposed so there's some uranium on the surface it's a lot lower here in houston at sea level um, so that gives you a good base reference point an airline crew flying at 35,000 feet gets an additional two millisievert a year so they kind of double their background exposure it's not that much but since their radiation well they're not technically defined as radiation workers right now, but um, they get a little bit higher dose because they're at higher, higher altitudes and the atmosphere is not filtering that GCR. CT scan, for example, seven millisieverts per event. Okay, the other two are per year. So that gives you an idea of what you're doing when you go in for a scan, some kind of medical treatments. One hit, about 10 minutes or actually a few seconds, but CT scan is about seven. So taking that into the space program, the average shuttle skin dose, surface dose, was four millisieverts. It's about twice the yearly background. But keep in mind for space missions, this is the course of about a week or two, depending on the mission. So 
it's quite a lot higher than a year's worth of background radiation because it's, it's short duration. The highest skin dose was 80 millisieverts. That was during an EVA, there was a solar flare up and they got hit with a little harder um, some protons and they have less shielding because of the suit. But that's still not unreasonable for the, the doses that, that we allow the astronauts to get. Apollo 14 was 14 millisieverts. That was a 30 day, 33 day mission on the surface of the moon when they did, I think, a total of about nine hours on surface EVAs outside the, the ship. Um, most of that dose was received passing through the trap belts, the proton belts, the Van Allen belts that are due to the Earth's geomagnetic field. So that was actually not received on the surface of the moon. Skylab 4 was further out, a further, uh, a higher orbit and it was a high inclination so the geomagnetic protection was not there and it was a longer mission so they got 178. So it's quite a bit higher and it's something that people should pay attention to but the a good rule of thumb for the dose that, that is given to an astronaut is about one sievert per year. That's probably a, a good global limit. I mean that depends on whether you're talking about dose to the eyes, dose to the, the bone marrow, the blood forming organs, or finger skin can get more. But as a general rule, whole body exposure there, I'm sorry, I misstated that, it's half a sievert per year. So we give them half a, sie uh, half a sievert, so we give them 500 millisieverts, so that even at Skylab 4 mission, the astronauts can go up on a few missions a year and not exceed legal limits. That becomes a problem when we go to Mars. A two and a half mission to Mars, pending there's no solar flares and, and nothing increases from there, of course that's, there's a high probability in two and a half years that that will happen even in a quiet sun. Um, they're projected to get about a sievert from the background cosmic radiation. So in two years, that's right at mission at legal limits, and in two and a half years, if they, they're a little bit under it. But if anything else goes on, if they get hit, if there's a solar event and they get a little bit higher proton dose because of a solar particle event, then they're going to be beyond, exceed career limits and that astronaut can't fly. So it's not that the doses are, and actually the, the regulations were designed to be given increased cancer risk of 3%. So the general rule of thumb is 3% per sievert. If you get a sievert in a year, it's said that your cancer risk will increase by about 3%. If related to the older units, where does that correspond? Times 100. So uh, one sievert is 100 rem. Okay. Um, that's why you'll see a lot of things like centisievert. It becomes a rem, one rem. Uh, so it, it's things that are not necessarily damaging, this question, um, but it's something that needs to be paid attention to because if anything else goes on, they're at career limits and all the training we've done for the astronauts are at the end because we have to retrain and respin. This astronaut will, will likely not have any serious short-term effects. It's not acute. They won't go into prodromal syndrome and, and lose uh, uh, the red blood cells from the marrow and things like that. But it is something that, that poses a risk of cataracts in the long term, leukemia in the long term. So it's things we have to bring down. We have to watch that. So it's right now at the limit, and anything we can do to, sh to, to, increase, to decrease that prolongs the mission, makes things a little bit safer, and the astronauts are much happier about it. Okay? So the general background radiation is from the, the galactic environment. This is, again, saying that pending no solar flare-ups, things like that, just the ambient background radiation. It's from particles from protons to nickel, and, and I designate that here by the, by the charge number of the particle. So, so Z equals 1 to 28, and most experiments, a lot of biology experiments you'll see, they use, they're using a lot of heavy iron for their experiments. And it's energies from thousands of EV to hundreds of billions of, e, of electron volts per nucleon. So it, it ranges a broad span of energy. So we've got a mixed ion field and a mixed energy field, and it's a complex field that you won't find anywhere on the surface of the Earth. It's unlike that that we're used to dealing with. So, it's, it's new. That's the end of the day. Already. <laughs> Sorry, you could sleep. Everybody else will. Um, for the purposes of dosimetry, above 30, 30 million electron volts is what we're interested in. These are the particles enough to penetrate the hull of a ship and penetrate the suit and things like penetrate mild atmospheres like Mars. The, these will make it through. These are very long range high energy particles. Most of the spectrum is above 30, so the, they will all encounter a 
most of the spectrum inside the ISS, even though they have the hole around. This is kind of a general relative contribution of that to give you some kind of idea of what we're dealing with. Mostly protons, mostly alpha, 87% protons, 12% helium nuclei, and the rest are all the heavies. So on a, on a percentage scale, it doesn't look like there's really much going on down there. There's, there's so few interactions that they don't, at first look, seem to be a problem. However, like I said, dose was the energy imparted divided by the mass that's imparted to. So the heavier you go up on the periodic table, the more energy those ions can impart because you've got a really big, heavy nucleus driving through tissue, so it's going to drop a lot more energy as it's passing through. Like Protons are one nucleon. An iron particle, charge of 26, is 56 nucleons, so it's 56 times the power of a proton. So if we weight these by the dose they're capable of delivering, we see a completely different story, and now they all start to become equal players in the field. Now all these look like they're, they're something that we should consider instead of just measuring protons and calling it good. Um, there's a second catch to that. It's not only the energy that it's able to impart, but the method that it gives up that energy. And, and here's an old nuclear track emulsion that shows up in a lot of the physics books on, on radiation detection. And this is showing you a microscopic track of particles from protons to iron. And you can see how much more dense the energy deposition is in the iron track. I mean, it's just boring a hole through anything it encounters. Just like a mass truck, if you will. These are all GeV particles. I believe they're GeV, but yes, they were equated. Um, so it gives you good visual representation of what's going on if this particle was, say, going through a, through a cell. Right? The width of the track in, in the iron case is probably bigger than the cell's nucleus. So, so there's another consideration here in the biology. They come up with the, the concept of radiation quality. And they say it's related to the biological effectiveness of a radiation. It's usually related to a base point of an irradiation of gamma or x-rays and then move forward from there. And it's, it's dependent on energy, as you might suspect, because different energy pro particles can deposit more. But it's mainly dependent on the, for charged particles, it's dependent on the charge of the particle. So if we come up with a quality and look at biological effectiveness, we multiply the dose by this quality factor and call it a dose equivalent. And the red is what you see now in the galactic, in, in the galactic cosmic radiation environment. So what we first thought was iron, uh, pro uh, protons and helium being most of the players is not true anymore. The protons and the helium account for about 15% of the field when you talk about biological effectiveness. And iron, which was down at two one hundredths of 1%, is now the biggest player in delivering dose and just boring a hole through whatever it counters. So the heavy charged particles are much more important biologically than you would first guess if you measured them with a silicon telescope or something like that. So, then just to kind of sink the point home, this is the energy distribution that each one of these might see. They're, they're about the same for all practical purposes. They have a, a, a broad peak at about five or 600 MeV per nucleon. So same velocity, right, at about five, 600 MeV. But go all the way out to 10 to the sixth MeV. Very small numbers, but they are there. And those we're just going to ignore. But um, like I said, from, from 30 MeV up, is important for dosimetry, so pretty much below where those graphs stop, it, we're not interested, that it'll be shielded by the hull of the craft. Anything above that, pretty what you see drawn there, is what is going to be penetrating and, and will encounter, the astronauts will encounter that. So it's all important. Um, okay, so what do we do? Looking at radiation protection, taking it back to the, to the person inside that ship. In Ground-based scenarios, in industry, they come up with the, the term ALARA. And that means as low as reasonably achievable. It's a benefit-burden analysis. They say that taking the presumption that no radiation dose is a good dose, anything is potentially damaging, what can we do cost-effective that reduces that dose? We say that, that given the benefit of what we get from a dose reduction, is the cost too much of a burden to do that mission? So the dose, I'm sorry, I said that backwards, but the dose is the burden, and we see how we can benefit that by just simply balancing. If we can buy five 
dollars worth of lead and put it in the way, then that's a good thing to do. We should do it. If it costs us $100,000 to do something, maybe that task doesn't need to be done. Okay, so from this, we come up with three tenets of time, distance, and shielding. And that's pretty much how health physics is started in any environment here in the States in radiation protection. We reduce the time we're in the radiation environment. We increase the distance at all times. Don't loiter around the source. You use tongs to separate yourself if possible. And we increase the shielding. We just pack on masks and everything's fine. Keep yourself behind a wall. Keep yourself behind lead. In the space program, that doesn't really apply because we have a fixed mission timeline. The astronaut schedules are fixed every second of every day of every minute until they come home. Launch window, return window, and that's it. They're, they're there. So there's nothing we can do about time. The distance is again on its head because in the terrestrial sense, we have a radiation source somewhere and we can leave. It's exactly the opposite in the space program. The GCR is... Um, it's isotropic, all directions, and we're in the middle of it. We can't go anywhere, so we can't move away from it. So we're left with shielding. We have restricted payload allocations. We can't carry any more mass, or we couldn't fly a Hubble telescope. So if we start packing mass on, the mission is, use, is pointless, and we don't fly. We go up, and we take pretty pictures, and come back down. And that's about all we're left with. So time is out. Distance is out. Shielding is not out, because we're fixed by mass but we can take a closer look at what mass we fly. Okay, so if we have a thousand kilograms we can fly, that doesn't mean we have to fly aluminum, it doesn't mean we have to fly lead. So this is where all the studies at NASA started. Let's look at the mass we fly and try to make some assumptions about what is an effective shield. And that's where we're going with that. So now we kind of get into the, the crux of, of this presentation, given that background. And we look at Three things. We're fixed with mass, so we want to analyze things on an equal mass basis, right? Density times thickness, rho dx. That gives you an equal area density. Anything that, that has an aerial density of three grams per square centimeter presents three grams in front of that particle to stop it. They have much different thicknesses, right? Lead will be a lot thinner because it's a, a much more uh, a denser material. Um, water or poly with a density of one, three grams will be three centimeters. Aluminum will be about two. Um, about one and a half. And so we start off with the same mass that's going to block this and see where we can go with that. We go back then and look at the theory, the math behind charge particle interaction in matter. We can't stop the GCR. That's, that's a given. We can change the field a little bit maybe, but it's all going to penetrate. So how do we maximize dose reduction? We stop looking at how much mass just to stop it. And we have to look at what its effect are after it emerges. Then we design a better shield, hopefully, and finally we take it to ground-based accelerators and test it. Now we can't simulate the galactic environment, so we take single ion, single energy beams and use multiple target experiments and kind of do like an eye doctor exam, better one or two, better two or three. And we change, all, change the energy of the ion and repeat the process and just do this ad nauseum like factory work and then we change the ion and change all the energies and get up some kind of metrics for how well this is performing and hopefully it performs like we, we thought it should or we should change careers. Uh, so this is a representation of a cross section of a shield on an atomic scale. Okay? If, if we take that the white are the nuclei of the atoms and the blue represents the electron cloud around them, we in a charged particle interaction we can pretty much have two processes. We can have a nuclear collision or electromagnetic interaction. Right? Coulomb forces slowing it down. So it's, it's very binary. We have a hit or no hit. First step is good. So let's, let's look at that first one. Let's look at a hit. What do we have in a nuclear interaction? We've got a, a particle at a pretty high, high velocity traveling into the nucleus of the atom, whether it's tissue, whether it's shielding. They come together and they break up in two fragments. Okay? In the laboratory frame of reference, we only measure the incident particle fragments. The target fragments, the fragments generated from the target atom, uh, nuclei, have such a, such a slow velocity that the, shield effect, that the shield effectively filters all those. They don't go anywhere, right? In the center mass system, that's not true. But since we live in the center of the laboratory system, then that's pretty much what we see. And 
going back to the very end of this story, the dose delivered by these particles is a function of the square root of their charge. Lower charge means lower dose. In the case of a carbon projectile, a carbon beam or a carbon ion coming through the hole of a spacecraft, you can see that if we break it up into three helium ions, three helium nuclei, that we've reduced the charge by a factor of three, right? Six squared and three times two squared is 36 and 12. So we've effectively reduced the dose by three just by breaking it up in that fashion. And, and we have no, no choice really in what fashion it breaks up, but it's just an example. So fragmentation is a very good thing for dose reduction. So we want to maximize the fragmentation. We look at different, different uh, uh, we look at the math and see what maximizes fragmentation and see how we can do that, okay? For the purposes of this lecture, there's, there's whole semesters in interaction probabilities and cross-sections and things like that, so you're going to just have to believe me that the probability of interaction of a particle is equal to the atomic density of a target, the, the number density, times the geometric cross-section. And for example, what you're saying is there, there's a, the cross-section is a probability of interaction of one atom, the, of, of a projectile hitting the nucleus of an atom, and then we just multiply that by how many atoms we have in the sample, right? The cross-section of a single interaction is related to the uh, two-third, the cube root of atomic mass number squared of the target. Now, quite technically, it's a, a sum of the cubed roots of the target nucle the target mass number and the projectile mass number. But we've just said that we're doing single beam experiments and changing the target in all case. So the mass number of the projectile became a constant. And now, our, now it's simply a function of, not, not simply, but it reduces to a function of uh, the square of the cube root of mass number of the target. And we multiply that then by the number density, Avogadro's number divided by the mass number of the target times rho dx. Oh, that, so we're now seeing that this equivalent mass is starting to show its face, right? Rho dx, density times thickness. And we can normalize by rho dx by dividing that out of the equation. And we're left with the probability of an interaction on an equal mass basis is a function of an inverse function of the cube root of the mass number. So what does that tell us when we're designing a shield? That right there says lead is a horrible shield, right? Heavy mass, inverse of heavy is bad. Lighter on the periodic table are better for fragmenting a beam. So it's kind of counterintuitive. We're here in base, we're just packing on more lead, packing on the ma all the mass we can, but we have the mindset that we're just going to stop everything and, you can, and lead is very efficient in getting a lot of mass in the way. Right? If we had an equal mass of, of polyethylene, we'd have, we'd have eight feet of wall, whereas lead, we have you know, a few inches. But lead is a horrible shield for fragmenting the vein. So that also says that hydrogen is the best. Okay? For, for practical reasons, we can't have hydrogen targets. I'm jumping ahead of myself. Right? We're not going we're, we're to have the resources have a solid hydrogen target wrapped around the shuttle. <laughs> Liquid hydrogen becomes possible in the form of water. We're carrying water everywhere. We jacket, we jacket the inside of the hull with water and we have a little more shielding. Okay, we're carrying water anyway. Poly is a little bit better. Remember I said that the lighter the element, the better the shield. So carbon's lighter than oxygen, so poly should be a little bit better than water. Poly's easy to get. It's relatively inexpensive. We can man machine it. The problem with poly is it, it, it's not structural and it's not thermal. So it bends and flexes and breaks and it'll probably burn up and melt on, on re-entry. So we can't make a ship out of poly. We can line a current ship with poly and make it a little better, but we can't make it, uh, a ship. So NASA started looking at hybrid composites because there are plastics high in hydrogen um, and they used like a, a carbon fiber composite. Now that's structural and probably thermal as well, but they're also trying to load the hydrogen. So they get extra hydrogen here and there when they're, they're designing the composites and see how these perform, and they should perform better than poly. Poly's taken as the reference material. Anything plus or minus poly, then, then we test and make metrics and see how it's working out. Let's kind of graph, uh, show you visually how that's working. This is GEV iron at NSRL, NASA Space Radiation Laboratory in Brookhaven, New York. Um, and we took equal masses of aluminum and poly, 
So we had, in this case, it was five grams per centimeter square. So we had five centimeters of poly and about three centimeters of, of aluminum. And put it in the beam line, fragmented it, and looked what came out. The blue is the aluminum, and the red is the polyethylene. And you can see that the fragmentation is much higher for polyethylene. And since dose goes as charge squared, we have reduced the dose quite a bit in a poly target just by using a poly target instead of the aluminum target. Okay, so far, so far we're good. So now let's go into the second interaction, the non-hit. A little bit more detail in that one. I'm just still not going to give you the entire equations because there's semesters on that as well. And, and I used to sit through seminars and people throwing Green's functions at me and Laplace transforms and start talking about eigenvalues of Schrodinger's equation and, and I was asleep right away. So, <laughs> again, trust me on this one. We can sign up for the class if you really want to argue. Um, but we take the electromagnet, the Coulomb interactions are slowing the particle down as they pass through the electron field and we get a rate equation. The rate of energy lost per thickness that it travels in the material. It's this pointer? Yeah. It it, the yellow button. Okay. So it, it, it's loosely a function of properties of the target and properties of the projectile incident on the target, right? So the GCR or the beam. Um, and there's we have a rho dx in there again, so we can take out the rho of the target and we're normalized to equal masses again. It's very convenient. So it's a function of, again, it's a function of uh, z over the target, the charge squared versus the velocity squared of the projectile. Again, we're using single ion, single energy beams, so in cross-comparing different targets, this again becomes a constant, and we're looking only at the charge to mass ratio of the target. All right, so the simplified problem, pretty straightforward. Doesn't help us much, at least not in the case of, uh, of taking energy out of the beam, because most particles have our z over a of, of a half, right? So helium is, is two protons and, and four nucleons, so it's, so it's 0.5. Iron is 26 versus 56, so it's about 0.4647. So it's about half, doesn't, except for hydrogen again. Hydrogen is unity, one proton, one nucleon. So Hydrogen is maximized in a target for energy loss in the beam. Hydrogenated materials are the best at attenu fragmenting and attenuating the beam. So what's all this lead stuff doing in ground-based studies, right? It's efficient. Um, not quite the end of the, uh, of the problem because these could be competing processes, right? We said that it's most efficient at attenuating charged particles. That's true. Biologically, that's not a good thing because if we go back to the original equations now, knowing what we know, and if we say that we're done with our shielding design, we have a shield that we like, CH2, polyethylene, and now we're looking at what happens after that shield and we're looking at the astronaut, our target becomes fixed. Our target's now human tissue. And we have GCR, and well, actually, even in the single ion experiments, we have an ion incident on the target the same ion leaving the target at a different energy. So the ion becomes the variable now. We fix the target, the human, at the end, and our ion has changed. The charge has not changed, but the velocity has. The velocity is slow. We have one over a smaller number, so we have a larger dose coming out of that target from Coulomb interaction. Right? So fragmenting was good for dose reduction, but electromagnetic slowing is not little bit small reduction in velocity and we get a little bit higher dose. Um, so the competing process is the good to this side is that by having some mass in the way we've effectively shielded out all the low energy stuff. So that's a benefit. So this one's a little bit more complex. Uh, okay, this is, this is a graphical representation of DEDX for G, or 500 MeV iron in water, in tissue. And you can see that it starts out, when, it's, when it starts hitting, interacting with matter, starts out pretty flat, slows a little bit. As it comes to a stop, other processes are going on. There's a lot to do with shell theory and, and corrections. It starts picking up orbital electrons and throwing them off in singles and doubles and, and other interactions. It's bouncing around. It's not exactly forward anymore. And as it stops, it's giving up all of its energy in that track. So we have, we have a, a steep increase in energy deposition toward the end. So this is what you're seeing. 
if you block off the first five centimeters of this with a shield, and now you're starting here, your energy deposition is starting to rise a little bit, having the effect of no shielded beam is the blue curve, and a shielded beam, it broadens that curve because it's bringing it back toward you. You've got some mass in the way before it encounters it, and your dose increase is basically the difference in those two curves, the integral under that. So you can see that, that the energy deposition is higher, therefore the dose in tissue is higher. So we've got one process is good, one process is sometimes good, sometimes not. All right, so we put it in the beam line, we test it, and look at the overall contribution of each one of these, and we have to define a metric, like that eye doctor, better one or two, what does it mean? We, we with a, a silicon telescope, we measured dose by measuring fragments and energy loss, before, without a target and with a target, right? The target out control experiment and then all the targets. So if we have 97% of the dose left from the beam emerging from the target, that means the target was 3% effective, right? And we so we said, that's the effectiveness of a target based on the difference in dose before and after, one minus that being the, effect, the shield itself. So we repeat this ad nauseum, single ion, single energy, change the energy, multiple targets, change the energy, multiple targets, repeat with a different ion, change the targets, and, and on and on. What we're left with at the end is this is the single ion, single energy experiments with different targets. GeV iron, because iron was so high on the dose equivalent, you'll see a lot of biology done with GeV iron, so we look at GeV iron. And you'll see for a fact, this is the fraction of dose reduction normalized per mass, per gram per centimeter squared. Copper is the worst shield against the galactic environment. I, I do have lead as well. I don't know why it's not on here, but copper, as the, as the elementals get lighter, we start seeing a, a larger dose reduction. Um, these are some composites, some hybrids that NASA was testing in the beam line. Here we have aluminum poly hybrid, right? Seven grams, uh, poly, lithium, lithium fluoride, on and on. And as the total mass of these these uh, molecules get lighter, you see a, a better dose reduction. And so, so, so it looks like for single ion, single energy, the fragmentation controls the process, right? Because Actually, GeV iron is not going to lose much energy in thinner targets like five grams, four grams of stuff. So you're not really affecting the energy loss much. Uh, Mars bar. Mars bar is the epoxy here is one of the best players. We can we can make a theoretical hydrogen line here by subtraction of poly and carbon, but hydrogen would be the best. Pure epoxy is highly hydrogenated, so epoxy is really good. Mars bar goes on the theory that if you're going to be on the surface of the moon, or surface of Mars in this case, um, you take the regolith, mix it with epoxy, make bricks out of it, and make a habitat out of that. So now this, is, this was the Mars bar. It's not chocolate. Not in this case. <laughs> we have done exotics in the beam line. We, we, we have put all the food that flies on, the, on the, the missions in the beam line and looked at the fragment products of, say, GCR against peanuts to see if, you know, what kind of dose they're getting inside. Would the GED be similar? The Mars atmosphere, it's very similar. The, the galactic environment around Mars, it's, it's all over the solar system, is the same. The only difference in Mars is Mars has about 15 grams of atmosphere in the way, 15 grams per centimeter squared. So Mars atmosphere provides about the same shielding as does the ISS. The ISS, on average, is about 15 to 20 grams of aluminum. That's pretty thick, but that includes all the instrument panels inside and everything else. So it's about 15 grams of aluminum equivalent, and Mars is about 15, 16 grams. So that affords a lot of protection. The moon, there's nothing, so they're hit with the brunt of the GCR. Um, the benefit of, of ISS in low Earth orbit is we're also shielded by the geomagnetic field. So that cuts out a lot of the electron dose, a lot of the low proton energy dose. They get trapped up in the belts, and depending on our inclination, uh, at high inclinations, the magnetic field's bending in, there's almost no no uh, protection. Down at lower inclinations, there's a lot of protection. So, well, depending on where we are, except depending on where we need to be, where we need to be able, they're they're, they're looking at the the bottom pole. There's a crater down there that they can pretty much get sunlight, water, but they can also get sunlight 75, 80 percent of the time because they're always pretty much spotting it. So they're they're down there where they're not blocked by the moon. The moon does go through the Earth's geomag field in the tail behind it about 25% of its time. So there will be some protection there. Um, 
there was a crew on ISS not too long ago that was out during a large solar particle event. And luckily enough, they were phased to be behind the Earth and, behind, and in the back of the geomag field, so they weren't hit with anything. Had they been around the front at the time, they would have gotten a, a pretty good dose. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things taking into taken play, and the location of the moon 25% of the time is very good. Um, okay, so now we roll different beams, different energies into the same target. And I said that poly was the reference material, so to do kind of an engineering study, we just ran poly. We always had poly in our, in our cross-section measurements because we would do a uh, determine total charge changing and fragment production cross-sections for um, all the elementals, and we wanted to get a theoretical hydrogen cross-section, so we would subtract carbon from the poly. So we had a lot of poly. What you see here is, and I'm sorry, I've changed the, the terminology up. Before you had fraction of dose reduction, I've just multiplied 100, turn it into a percentage. But it's kind of a double negative, because a negative dose reduction is a dose increase. But the top, the colored curves are equal energies, equal velocity beams. So the light blue is GeV particles from, say, what is it, nitrogen, silicon, uh, titanium, and iron on the top. And so we just, this, this horizontal scale is charge. So as the scale goes up, the charge of the beam goes up, but they're, e they're connected by equal energies. So we have GeV, 600 MeV, 400 MeV, and 250 MeV per nucleon. And we ran all these tests. Now, she's like checking out new classrooms. Um, as you can see, the high energy stuff's pretty flat. It gives you a really good dose reduction. The low, the very low energy stuff, 290, gives you a dose increase. What's happening here is, regardless of the beam ion, of the incident ion, its energy is high enough where you don't get much energy loss through modest amounts of shielding. So the, elect the Coulomb interaction is not that much of a player. You're down there on the plateau, as you saw on that graph. Fragment fragmentation is dominant up at high energies. So you're seeing a lot of fragmentation, no ionization energy loss. As you move down in energies, you're seeing that the ionization energy loss starts dominating and takes over for the low energies because now you're climbing that steep, that steep peak on that curve. It's dropping all its energy, and that overcompensates for whatever fragmentation you get. And keep in mind, this is a, it is, is a highly mixed field, multiple energies, multiple ions, and so all these processes rolled together give you one metric. We took some Monte Carlo codes that we wrote in, at, at Berkeley and ran all of the ions of the GCR and all of the energies for each ion and, and just let the computers beat that up. And thank God nowadays the computers can handle something like that in, in reasonable time. And the 2.2% here dotted line is the effect of that poly per gram um, for the GCR, an average spectrum of GCR with energies and everything combined. So, end result is of both competing processes you still get a good dose reduction program if you use the lighter materials. This goes down for the heavier materials just like we saw um, in the previous slide but hydrogenated materials are good shields you can afford two percent per gram on average for the first few layers of the shield it starts becoming less effective as you get thicker and thicker in shielding it starts becoming counterproductive because just like the low energy ion here, as you get thicker, the ions are starting to slow down in the shield more and more, and you start climbing that curve, you start getting energy loss taking over, and you, the shield becomes less. So, so the first few grams you'll get 2%, the next one you'll get 1.8, 1.6, 1.5, and there's a point where it's not worth putting any more shield on. Particles are going to come through. Um, you've, you've cut out a lot of the low energy particles, but then you just start flying mass for nothing. Okay, so 20 grams is is about that, that cutoff, really, 20, 25 grams. Um, I do a lot of modeling, so I like visuals. This is kind of what we've done. We've taken a mixed field GCR, run it through a shield, made it a worst mixed field, and now we've got a person in the back. Right? So now we're going to go looking at, at the effects to the person. You guys thought you were done. Um, and bring that all back into dose symmetry and go back to the original slide on biological effectiveness. All right? I made some comment earlier and I said that, that look at how different the damaging abilities are of all these particles. And to convolute that statement in biology, they take the frame of reference as an equal dose of X or gamma radiation. 
So if we think charged particles are all very different in their damaging ability, going back then and comparing that to photon interactions gets a little worse. Basically, what we're looking at then is the same kind of a study, target fragmentation, energy loss, but now we're doing it on a DNA. Right? We're looking at different effects that, that light ion tracks, X-rays, protons, are having versus a heavy ion track that's just boring a hole into it. For the purposes of radiation biology, that iron particle, right, it's just cutting a hole through everything it sees. A dead cell is a good cell because a dead cell will not go on to cause a mutation that can then go on to cause gen genomic instabilities and tumors and cancers. So when it cuts a hole through the DNA and that cell can't survive, that's good. The problem is the density of energy deposition around that iron particle, as it's going through this matter, it's shooting off delta rays like you wouldn't believe at some pretty far distances that can reach other cells. These delta electrons interacting with the cell will not kill the cell and will cause some cause uh, equivalent of like the light, light ion problems, and that then goes on to become uh, transmutation or translocation or, or some genomic instability, whatever you will, that can go on to cause cancers and things like that. So it's not the direct, direct effect of a particle going through tissue that you're worried about. It's the bystander, they call it the bystander effects. The cells start signaling to each other that something's going wrong before they die. Other cells pick up on that, get hit with an electron, and start going a little bit crazy, and then the long-term effect of that is yet to be figured out. Um, so, instead of going on with that, we're setting up, there's, there's course loads in that as well, as is everything. Um, we're going to give a, a survey of radiation biology in the fall on Tuesdays from 7 to 10. A little bit of a marathon session, but it's only one day a week. So we can get in, chowder all we want, get away. And we're going to pick up this topic and send it there and talk about cell survival curves and instabilities and translocations. So I think that'll be kind of fun. And I think you guys for good. Um, we ready for questions? No. See you. Yeah. Does forecasting of space weather help any for Mars missions? Well, thoughts go there, and you're going to be there for a long time. On the ambient background radiation, no, it's always there, right? On a solar particle event, yes, because we, sitting console at NASA, we have to plan for contingency. Um, and let's talk about the lunar mission because that one is actually being planned and coming up. And it is predicted that a lunar surface EVA could be 8 to 10 hours away from habitat. So they're away from the habitat where they're fully shielded, where they're actually stopping everything. And the only concern for habitat, sorry to get off the subject, but is neutron dose. Because once you've stopped all the charged particles, neutrons get through and your only dose will be neutrons. <coughs> but 8 hours on EVA... When we land on the surface of the moon, it's 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 lunar, it's a solar minimum again, like it is now. So it's a quiet sun, but it's all a game in probabilities. A quiet sun doesn't mean it won't have a charge uh, a proton event, right? It just means the probability is less. The severity could be equally large, um, and we've seen that in a quiet sun on ISS. It was a quiet sun, nothing going on, and there were three events during an EVA or around the time of EVA planning. Luckily, there was no one on EVA at that time. But the probability of that happening was so small as to be negligible. But we have to be prepared for that. So there's a lot of work going on in the solar physics community right now for trying to forecast the sun. I mean, they're, they're having a, a hard enough time forecasting hurricanes. They do it reasonably well. As it gets closer, you have better information. The confidence interval is tightened up. Same with the sun. When, when the active regions start up, I have no idea when that's going to go off. As they build, as they get bigger, NOAA labels them now. Now it's a delta spot or a gamma spot. Now it's, now it's getting important, and we start watching it. right? And a flare goes off. doesn't mean there's charged particles coming, but it means it's highly likely. A flare associated with type 2 radio bursts. Now the confidence is... So we're doing kind of the hurricane tracking. But we don't know until that proton hits the GO satellite or the A satellite and starts escalating. We don't know that there's protons coming. We don't know there's a dose. There's a lot of work being done to try to change that and try to forecast. Um, in the last, since STS-122, in the last two months, we now have a tool that will give us an hour advance warning on protons. At the time of flare, we know if there's going to be a proton event or not. And so that helps. The protons rise incredibly steep, steeply, and so if we can spare that first hour of dose, 
and get them back to, to Rover, who in this case they'll be far away from HAB, then we've taken a lot of dose out and we've helped that astronaut go on the next mission because we've spared some dose. There's also a lot of work being done with vector magnetograms to try to give us not, not a planning of when that event's going to happen, but they can tell us within 24 hours if there's going to be a flare, they think. More important for mission ops is tell us if the energy is not built up sufficient to cause a release, so we're going to forecast the all clear. We're going to set safe to EVA now for eight hours. In six hours, I can't give you that confidence, but right now, go get it over with. Right? So, but if we can spare the brunt of that dose, especially on a two and a half year mission, on a two and a half year mission, you could exceed career limits very fast. But also on the surface of the moon, if you're out on EVA and you get hit with a large charged particle event, you could be getting you could be getting a gray, and start having the onset of prodromal syndrome where the the bone marrow sloughs off. There, there's this this scenario you've heard of astronauts melting and dying is not going to happen. I mean, basically that they're they're not up there for long enough, and the, they will have some radiation sickness syndromes, but they will make it home. And most of the point is I don't mean to minimize that because. Radiation damage, radiation exposure is the only risk of a mission that that astronaut carries with him till his death. All, when you go up on a mission and come back, all the risks of that mission are over with, right? Hydrazine, hydrazine tanks blowing up, gone, you're home. You know, running out of oxygen, you're home. All the risks that they look at are done except for the radiation risk. You've been exposed and you carry that now into the future for the next 30 years. So it's, a, it's a, an accumulated risk. And if we can spare as much as we can spare, especially forecasting is going to be a huge tool. It's very new. It's very in its infancy. But, uh, a lot of work at Goddard. A lot of work through the heliophysics department. Um, there's a lot of private uh, Northwest Research Institutes doing some good work. Swery is doing some good work. Most of it's funded by um, the Living with a Star program out of Goddard and out of headquarters. It's great stuff. <laughs> I was a solar physicist. You all look at like a directional design. So, you know, you design just one part of the shuttle for our, or a new vehicle, whatever it is, you know, you're going to get a certain attitude, and that's you know, obviously for the, for the background, you're not going to do it, but for maybe a solar flare, you're going to get one attitude. Or like even a space suit where they can manipulate the body with one attitude to. Right, right. Um, right. And GCR is isotropic, but, you know, when a solar particle event goes off, and the acceleration of these particles are packing up against themselves. It's kind of like a, a traffic jam in rush hour. And then when the cars are freed up, there's still this kind of latent effect, right? There's a shock wave there. And this the CME, this coronal mass ejection lifting off the, shunt of the sun, carries with it a bow shock. And the particles are starting to get so mixed up behind that shock, and it's distorting magnetic fields and everything. And so by the time that CME arrives, you're pretty much in, except for the initial shock, you're pretty much in an isotropic field behind it. So there's not a lot you can do with that. Now, on the surface there are, of course, because you're blocked, you're too pi, right? You're blocked by the, the planet. And kind of interestingly enough is we've been doing, um, not me, but the group, has been doing radiation protection since, since Project Mercury. We've been flying dosimeters. Right now we're starting to build more tools. We have more satellites flying. We're, we're kind of bootlegging off of a lot of the science missions. But we've had dose. We know astronaut dose since astronauts have been going. And uh, the Apollo missions, their plan was, if there was a solar particle event, the crew was going to pack themselves on top of the commander. And so the commander were, were, would survive at all costs. They knew that, they knew also that probably there wouldn't be a life-threatening dose, but they would get hurt. But they were going to protect the, the commander by just laying on it and ride it out. So that was the contingency at the time. We're a little bit better at that right now. But. NASA now keeping a book on individual astronauts with respect to those We don't. We sit mission ops and we provide environmental report. There is a radiation, radiation health officer providing the legal dose reporting requirements for astronauts. Yes. What we do in console, we, we provide an environmental dose assessment in 25 millirem per day on this mission inside, ten, you know, 50 millirem outside, and they go back and figure out who was wearing what they did, and all the astronauts wear personal dosimeters. We don't deal with all that. We collect them. We have active radiation dosimeters on, on the ship as part of our kind of a, a correlating what we measure outside and measure inside, but another division, the medical division, does the personal dosimetry. 
and they do. They keep track of. They legally required to. I mean, it's an it's an OSHA institution, but OSHA backed off and said, "We don't do space flight. You make your own regulations, and we'll just leave you alone." So, yes. Short answer, yes. My name is Alex Monchak. I'm in the engineering management program here at the university, uh -huh. uh, trying to get back to work with NASA. And I had a question about President Bush initiative. The major risk for that initiative mm -hmm. of going to moon and going back to Mars mm -hmm. is not the radiation, but it's the particles. That it the radiation has been called the, the, a showstopper. The symmetry has been called a showstopper. Uh, so both of them? Yeah. My second question. I'm sorry, real quick. That's kind of average difference in the daily, the daily dose rate on ISS and the daily dose rate on Mars mission. The problem with it is we don't understand the biology enough. Biology dose is different for different endpoints, for translocations, for mutations, for genomic instability. So the markers are all different. We don't have a set term that says this is the dose symmetry. This is what the, the biology. We know the, the, the particle physics going into that, and then how the cells respond, we don't quite understand. So the confidence interval on the annual dose that, that I showed you, the mission dose uh, of, of 1,000 millisieverts, of one sievert, is large enough to throw the, the upper confidence bar on that well over mission limits. Okay? So if unless we can constrain the confidence interval and have a better certainty of what that dose is, we're running borderline at hitting career limits, and that's why it's become a showstopper. It's not that they're looking at, you know, too much radiation sickness issues. It's just that you've gone up to your legal limit. Now, legally, we can't fly that astronaut. So if we fly him knowing that he's going to exceed a legal limit, then we probably have the duty not to fly him before we go because we know he's going to exceed. If we know he's not going to exceed and then something happens, that's a different contingency. Thank you. My Sorry. second question was, uh, if you're going back to uh, Mars, or if you're going to Mars, can you create, they're starting to create magnetic fields, mm -hmm. which would intercept the charged particles, but that would do nothing for the uh, the photons. Right. You say X-ray, gamma dose, neutrons, so it comes, it's not a neutron the ambient environment. But, um, yeah, the, there, there is some work being done at that, and I like to see novel work because kind of basically the, the reason you have cell phones is because a guy at Motorola was a Trekkie fan. That's, that's fun to push. Nobody else is pushing it. He liked Star Trek and wanted to see those things, and, and he had the resources to do it. I like to see funding going in novel concepts. Right now, as it stands, Electrostatic shields are not very effective. We looked at a study of that and we pretty much took the mass of these electromagnetic shields and packed it around the hull. And the mass of the shield makes a better shield than does the electromagnetic effect. If they can get that up, they'll, it's, a great, it's a great idea. If they can get the efficiency of those things up, then, then, then yeah, it's worth looking at. Right now, they're, they're too heavy. The magnets. But it's a good start. I mean, you got to start somewhere. What kind of speed are the heavy particles like iron? Well, they're all, on the energy distributions, they're all equated to the same energy per nucleon that gives them the, the same velocity, right? 500 MeV per iron nucleon, the peak of those distributions, so 500 MeV per nucleon on anything, same velocities, are about 75% the speed of light. The beta is about 0.75. Uh, GeV particles are approaching 0.8 times the speed of light. For even very heavy ions. Yeah, for even very heavy ions. I mean, they, they start becoming relativistic very fast. Now, on that on that high energy tail, those those are relativistic ions. I mean, there's no and even at 0.75 the speed of light, relativistics play into the equations, right? Um, so that's why they're just extremely penetrating. The origin of those is still in, of much debate, right? Whether it was Big Bang blown up, and, and of course, when a solar particle event goes off, it's not just protons. There's there's mixed field radiations. They're extremely lower than what you see in the galactic environment, but it's kind of always feeding the ambient environment with a few new particles all the time. Supernova, supernova, is, you get a lot of charged particle production. So it's kind of great topics. You know, I mean, it's, it's great stuff. Hey. I missed the beginning. What about the interplanetary flight scale, five and a half months? Isn't it more dosage than on Mars? The interplanetary flights? Um, Mars is Mars is considered the longest dose just because it's two and a half years. 
right? And they're looking at different mission scenarios to Mars, whether they should, they should try to move around, get there faster and reduce the GCR, but stay on the surface longer and risk a solar particle event. The, um, if we go into like the lunar mission, the lunar mission is right now planned for two weeks. I'd probably do this just quicker by starting over. But they could be up to six months. The lunar missions could be up to six months. Um, would not be equivalent to Mars because most of this, most of it is is in the ambient GCR, which the lunar surface sees. You see it on, on a trip to Mars, but you're protected by the hull, but it's a longer trip. It could be equivalent to probably about about half of that, half of a Mars mission, maybe on a long-term lunar mission. Two weeks on the moon, the doses will probably be down here equivalent to Skylab or, or the high shuttle dose, because they're going to look at serious shielding issues on the moon because they're unprotected completely. No magnetic field. They're hit with most of it. But are there any scenarios where you see acute radiation sickness or is it strictly the cancer risk like this we're talking about? Um, no, and there's some studies going out to look at the onsets of acute radiation sickness to see what really triggers it because they know that, that at about a gray, at about, what are we looking at here? Um, at about a gray, now, now here I've got the biological effect rolled in calling it a siever. So a two and a half year mission to Mars is about one siever. A gray is the units of exposure. It doesn't take into the, the different weight of the different ions yet. It's just the dose, not the dose equivalent. But at about a, a gray exposure, you start losing red blood cells, prodromal syndrome. You don't start seeing, but now that has to be acute. That has to be short term within a week. You're getting, you're getting a, a, a year's worth of dose instantly. And then you start seeing those effects. Um, you could get a gray on the surface of the moon on an EVA if you've got a 72 type, I don't know if you're familiar with that, 72 type solar particle event and you're out for 8 to 10 hours. So you could lose red blood cells. Weakness, fatigue, you'll probably recover without a problem. You may have to have a marrow transplant, but you're probably okay without it. At about 5 gray, you start losing the GI lining, losing the hair, and start really seeing some radiation sickness effects. Uh, right, gray is equivalent to a rad, sievert's equivalent to a rim by a factor of 100. So about 100 rad, you start seeing bone, uh, bone marrow loss, and about 500 rad acutely, you'll start seeing uh, the real onset of radiation sickness, and, and it could be lethal without other problems. But five gray would be uh, 50 hours on surface EVA under a continuous charged particle event, proton event, uh, unprotected. And Oh, some could be days. Yeah, 2003 Halloween event went for about three days. Pretty serious event. Um, that's actually the one, just, just kind of coincidentally, that there was a radiation detector, Marie, orbiting Mars, giving us dose rates around Mars. Uh, I believe it was a JPL initiative. But it was designed a long time ago, it was designed because it was designed to look at, at, at GCR fluence. It was designed for a very slow rate. And... Marie died from the Halloween event. The proton storm killed Marie, so it's kind of ironic that a radiation detector was killed by radiation. <laughs> but old electronics, not radiation hard, and, and that's what we saw. But that was that was a strong event. Three or four days of pretty high energy protons. So how protected were the Marie Apollo capsule? How much protection would you be by the small capsule? You, you get about 10, 10 to 15 grams. I think Paula was, was more like 10 grams of aluminum in the way. And the ISS is between 15 and 20. To some places it's 5, but the average 15 and 20. So it was equivalent almost to an ISS. Quite a bit of mass in those things. I mean, so, so how much would that knock down in the first ball? Is it like 10%? Or? Oh, yeah. 5% um, per gram. So maybe 10, maybe 15. And now there's one astronaut that really doesn't like anything to do with radiation and, doesn't, and, and made, uh, made NASA fly extra poly on one mission to pack the sleeping quarters. So there's one sleeping quarter that has a lot of poly packed in it to, to further reduce the dose. And they started just to pack up the entire ISS. I'm sorry, I'm babbling a little bit. But they, they, they started putting it on the Russian modules, and the Russians decided they didn't like that because they weren't asked permission and made them take out all the poly from the Russian module. And... Now, if there's a solar particle event, all the Russians go into the U.S. side and sleep in the sleeping quarters. 
So the astronauts know better. The politics involved in it were quite a bit different. But, but uh, and how much uh, volume does it take to? Uh, well, I mean that's that's the double-edged sword. There's there's some of these particles. If you look at if you isolate a little piece of it, and you look at thin shields of target, the dose actually goes up depending on the target and the iron beam and all that stuff. So it starts looking like you know no shield is a good shield. In the case of high energy iron and, and electromagnetic interactions, that's true. And as you start packing up on the shield, you complex the field up a little bit more, but you've got a dose reduction. Any kind of shielding that you can put up that's, that's you know, worth talking about, a gram or two, I mean, we're not going to fly half a gram of anything because it's just, it's just not worth dealing with, will reduce the dose on most effects. Lead, actually, for the first five grams, increases the dose. Um, but so any shielding is good shielding. We, we can't fly enough shielding to stop anything. We can fly a little bit. The more we get, at a point of about 20 or 30 grams, you don't get any more bang for your buck. So mainly, mainly the point of the shielding, since you're not stopping anything, is the fragmentation and the fact that you're filtering out low energy stuff. Stuff that may have just made it in that stopped in the body is now filtered out and you don't get so many things actually coming to rest. And the counter side of that is you slowed other things down that do stop in the body, but you probably fragmented a lot. Yeah. Can you use different layers? Like have a yeah. Now there's that thought too because they got poly inside the ship, right? They poly inside aluminum, and there's a significant neutron dose created when particles go through matter as well. This is charged particle. We've been talking about GCR. In relation to the charged particle dose, the neutrons are negligible. When you're inside HAB and all you have, and you stopped everything, you have a high neutron dose high relative relative to nothing but in relation to charged particles the charged particles dominate so we tend not to really talk about it here poly is best at moderating neutrons if you moderate a neutron and slow it down it has a huge biological effect so fast neutrons a good neutron it doesn't see matter too much um, doesn't see the coulomb fields at all so if you put poly inside the hull the neutrons created in aluminum are moderated by the poly and the neutron dose goes up. If you put poly outside the hull, you effectively have a better neutron field for dosimetry purposes. You have a less neutron field inside the ship. But we can't put poly on the outside because it all melts when we come in. So <laughs> what do we do? But things like Kevlar, the micrometeor shields, stuff like that, have a lot of hydrogen in them because of the epoxies involved and stuff. So those do have that effect. They do provide some shielding and they're on the outside of the aluminum. Um, if you go to any of the any of the X-ray facilities and hospitals, they've got three or four layers of, of copper, titanium, or copper, tin, and some other stuff. And what they're doing is they create when 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 they have an interaction in the first copper, you create characteristic X-rays, copper X-rays, right, from the OG electrons going down. Those X-rays are then filtered better by a different type of material. And at, at some point, you stop making characteristic X-rays in, in the field because the energies are too low. So there's a lot of thought into the order of layering as well. It's like I think a characteristic lead X-ray won't come out with a copper shield, but a characteristic copper will come out of lead or you know, something like that. I'm, I'd have to look it up again. But yeah, there's some thought to that. And they've looked at some of the, some of the composites. They've looked at sandwiching Kevlar in between different things. And, you really don't get a lot of, when you're talking about not stopping the beam, you're talking about 10 grams, you don't get a lot of bang for the buck because you're just not affecting the beam too much. I mean, we're talking about tightening confidence intervals to get the dose down by 10% would be mission enabling. They're going to get a dose. If we can affect the 10%, then we give them a little margin of safety in there. Huh? Often a little bit about the radiation estimate talk about Monte Carlo and the computation and how about the HZ train? Uh, they are thinking about expanding from like 15 isotopes to 120 uh -huh. and taking account of the structure, nuclear structure and quantum yeah. database. Yeah, what would that do? I mean, is it going to increase any accuracy? That's the hope and that was kind of our job when I was at Berkeley National Lab is we did the experimental measurements on cross sections on charge changing and total fragment production to go into nuke frag to help that improve that code. It's semi-empirical code. It runs really fast and it does fairly well, but in an experimentalist frame point, I mean, our experiments are systematically good to about 10% accuracy with everything rolled in. And for a theoretician, that's horrible. He'd love to see stuff down below 1%. Well, you're not going to get it, but, but that was the point. To, 
run more and more cross-section experiments, more and more beam ion combinations, and put them into the code to help the code run more accurately. Because in the past, they ran proton interactions and scaled everything for the number of nucleons from a proton interaction, and it became highly divergent for heavy ions. There's a model called FITS that comes out of the Japanese wrote that did the other way around. They wrote it for the heavy ion and scaled it back. And so for light, light ions, it's not quite so good. But that's a continual source of work and continual improvement, and that will help cut down the source of error to narrow our confidence intervals and dose, yeah. And HZE's trend is used for all the, all the uh, ship designs we're running it right now for CEV module to try to help better design the CEV. They're on a mass, they have a mass problem too, so we can't fly too much shielding. But we do roll HZE trend, and every year it changes. Actually, HZE trends like snowflakes. There's so many of them versions around, and no two are alike, that we have to really lock them down on which is which is the one we should be using right now, because it's actively changing. Tom, it's working on Yeah, a lot of work. All right. Any other questions? Let's thank our speaker. Thank our speaker. Thank our speaker. Thank our speaker. Thank our speaker.